Hi, this is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church in Pittsburgh. This program will give you a glimpse into the life of an amazing group of people who are seeing God do tremendous things. We trust that you're encouraged by our rich worship service and the ministry of God's Word. We'd love to have you visit with us here some Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'd love to make you welcome, and I know the Holy Spirit would encourage you. We take time in His presence to enjoy Him. Love to have you do that with us here at Zion Christian Church. God, thank you for your presence in this place, God. I thank that we thank you that we can meet with you today. Can you reach your hand up if you need a touch from God? I could reach my hand up. I want to be touched by the Lord. Sing this with me real quick. Anointing. if uh, we could have our ushers distribute the elements of communion. We're going to take communion together in the presence of the Lord. And uh, so as you receive those elements, you're welcome to just hold on to those as we continue to worship.
Good to be back in Pittsburgh again, and several people that are here, they know who they are. We're having a special time of celebration today. We're celebrating about 35 years of friendship in God's kingdom, and uh, this is also a big celebration for us because uh, this month, that lovely young lady you saw in that picture up there a while ago, uh, she and I are about to have our 45th wedding anniversary, and... Um, we did things kind of unusual because we got married on a Saturday and my pastor ordained us to the ministry on Sunday. So we're also celebrating 45 years of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in now 30 different nations. And I was supposed to go to nation number 31 on March 12th, but unfortunately, uh, my trip to Myanmar, which is right next to China, uh, has had to be postponed, not canceled, but postponed because of the coronavirus threat. I was supposed to fly through two separate airports, namely South Korea and San Francisco, that are both facing different stages of lockdown and security problems, and I cannot afford to bring something home to my loved ones that could hurt them. So uh, keep praying for uh, China and for the countries around it and all these places that are affected by it, and I'm trusting God that I can get back to China and Myanmar uh, as soon as possible. Thank you so much for your prayers for us during this time. We really do appreciate it. I'd like to turn your attention this morning to a uh, passage of Scripture in uh, Luke chapter 17, and today we're going to be talking about the theme of the winning posture. Have you ever heard a sermon on posture before? Oh, yes, you have. You all had your mother tell you to stand up straight. You've had a sermon on posture. You just don't remember it. You forgot about it. You remember. You were, and your mother said, stand up straight. You know, when you're going to enter a fencing match, do you have to get your posture adjusted? Both your legs balanced, you know, looking at your opponent, watching the tip of his sword, make sure it doesn't touch you. Anybody play golf? Huh? People play golf, they study videos for hours to learn the right posture of the feet, the legs, the back, the neck, the hands, the head, the eyes the swing, so they can drive a ball 300 yards and impress somebody. <laughs> My son has two black belts in Taekwondo. Posture is very important because the guy that you are going to fight has hands that are so fast, he can break your nose in less than a second if you don't have the right posture. Any Steelers fans here? What's the posture before the ball is hiked? My son was an offensive lineman in high school. He was small, but he had this uncanny ability to get off the line a half second before the competition. And he was knocking down bigger players all the time because he had this ability to have the right posture and make the right move and make it fast enough to humiliate somebody larger than him. Posture. Any Pirates fans? I know a lot of lamentation, you know, is going on right now. I think they were in last place in their division last year. But, you know, they really are trying to hit the ball. You know, you have to you know, pray for them, you know, as they try to hit that little ball. And you, know, and you know the posture of the baseball player. You know. He's studying the hands of that pitcher because now these pitchers can take that ball in their hands and they can throw like eight or nine different pitches. And every pitch, the ball is held a little bit different, leaves the hand a little bit different. And that hitter has got to study those hands 
to try to figure out where that ball is coming. My son was a U.S. Marine. Yesterday we talked about this in the other, in the other message that I shared. And boy, how our U.S. government takes these slouchy, irreverent, disrespectful teenagers and molds them during basic training into razor-sharp soldiers for our country. And they learn a whole lot about posture. Let's read in Luke chapter 17 the shortest sermon that Jesus ever preached. Now, you might be getting excited right now because you're thinking you're in for a real short sermon. <laughs> I'm going to read to you the shortest sermon Jesus ever preached. That doesn't mean I'm going to share with you the shortest sermon that I've ever preached. So don't get too excited, okay? But I did see food come in. So you'll be amply rewarded if you'll just sit and listen for a while and maybe take some notes because they might really help you. Luke chapter 17 Anybody have any idea what the shortest sermon of Jesus was? Only three words. Luke chapter 17. You'll find them in verse 32. Luke 17, 32. Shortest sermon that our Lord ever preached. But man, did he pack a wallop into these three words. Let's read it. Remember? How many of you are there? How many of you are still in Leviticus? <laughs> Luke 17, verse 32. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Remember Lot's wife. What was that about? It was a sermon about posture. Because the messengers of God came to her home and told her that judgment is falling, and it's falling fast. And you've got to move. And you've got to move so fast away from the place of judgment that if you don't move fast enough, you're going to lose it. And you must not look back. Well, apparently Lot's wife liked some of the shopping malls in Sodom. And she just couldn't imagine the thought of her favorite uh, gym, you know, being turned into cinders or her favorite restaurant or her favorite clothing store, you know, going the way of the dodo bird. And what did she do? Instead of looking straight ahead, not to the left or to the right, but looking straight ahead, the straight and narrow way. What did she do? She had a posture problem. And Jesus talked about another guy with a posture problem. In Luke 9:32, we don't have to 9:62, we don't have to go there, but Luke 9:62 talks about a guy that is plowing. Has anybody ever plowed before? No, you buy your bread a giant eagle. You don't have to plow. <laughs> but this is a story about a guy plowing. And his job as a plowman is to plow a straight line. The same word is in there, straight. Straight ahead. And what did Jesus say about that guy that's plowing? Anybody that puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Not fit. So posture is a serious issue. These two little messages of Jesus let us know how important our posture in life is. You know, when that plowman looks back, then the donkey, the mule, or, the, or whatever animal he's using begins to veer off. Not fit. Posture, so important. I want to give you this morning five bad postures. And I'm going to finish with the winning posture. So hang on, we're in for a journey. 
You know, the children of Israel had great posture when they attacked and conquered Jericho. One reason for that was they were instructed very clearly how to walk, what to do, and what to say. They were to walk around the walls. They were then to blow the trumpets. And then they were to turn and they were to march forward as God, by his own miraculous power, made the walls fall flat. And they were to conquer the city of Jericho. And they did it. And they were excited about it, as you would have been too. But what they needed to realize is that in the land of Canaan, there were still 30 more kings lined up waiting to get a piece of them. There were seven separate nations in the land of Canaan, 31 separate kings, and 10 different strongly fortified cities like Jericho. So when Jericho comes down, and of course the churches have sung about how Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, we've been singing that song for centuries. We love to sing about Jericho, how the walls come a-tumbling down. But right after Jericho, there's 30 more characters just waiting for a chance to take you and me out. So right after conquering Jericho, it's not the time to let your posture down. Because right after Jericho, there's another enemy looming right in front of you. How many of you learned that as Christians? You know? Today you get a victory, but tomorrow there's going to be somebody else or something else. You have to keep your wits about you, and you've got to pay attention. So in this new year, I would like to be able to instill, by the grace of God, the winning posture in Zion Christian Church. All right? Again, thank God for Jericho. But there's 30 others waiting right behind him. We haven't got there yet. There are still some things to be conquered in you, in me, in us, in our country, in our church. Let's do it. Enemy number one, bad posture number one, is found in Joshua chapter 7. Verse 2 and 3. Go there with me if you will. Joshua chapter 7, verses 2 and 3. We're on page 299. That's my Bible. I don't know about yours, so that's my Bible. Hi, honey. My wife is in Nashville, Tennessee right now in our home watching us. She's probably as shocked as I was by her picture. How she got more beautiful and I got more ugly, I'm still trying to figure that out. (laughs) Joshua chapter 7 and verse 2. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai. I think it's pronounced Ai, I'm not really sure. It might just be I. I, I. Repeat after me. I, I, I. Yeah, okay. Whatever, however, is pronounced, okay? Which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel. And he said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai, or I, or I for an I. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. Do not make all the people toil up there, for they are few. Bad posture number one in the kingdom of God is called the casual posture. We took out Jericho. Come on, we're ready for you. And lo and behold, enemy number two was dinky. It was small. It wasn't even a fortified city like Jericho. And when they saw it, they said, this will be a piece of cake. We don't need the whole army to go up after these people. Send two or 3,000 men and 
We'll just hang around at the Dunkin' Donuts and wait for them to come back victorious. And there they are. And all of a sudden, over the hill, comes a defeated, weeping, travailing, wounded army. And over 30 of their men are dead. And Joshua was terrified. They were too casual. Just because you got a good victory for your marriage, a good victory in your job with your income, just because we had a great victory, a great move of God at our church, doesn't mean that we don't have to press in today, tomorrow, and the next day to keep living that way and maintaining what we've been receiving. God doesn't just call us to attain. He calls us to retain what we have attained or we could lose it. And they lost that battle. Number one, because of an excessively casual posture. Do not assume that you and your own carnal strength with your own natural skills can take out spiritual enemies. The weapons of your warfare, the Bible says, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to tear down every stronghold would come against you, your marriage, your family, your church. They're mighty through God. They're not mighty through you. Don't allow yourself in these last days to get casual. It's not time to be casual. It's time to be vigilant. Number two. This is the posture of greed. If you look at the verse before, Joshua 7.1 talks about it. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. Another translation uses the term anathema, or cursed. Things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of whoever he was, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. So here you have all these soldiers... And they're all marching straight into Jericho to conquer. But you got a guy right in the middle of the mix that instead of going in to conquer, is looking for stuff that he can get out of the deal. And lo and behold, that looker, that covetous individual, got his eyes focused on some valuable stuff in one of the Jericho homes. And he took it, and he hid it in his garment, and he took it home. The Bible never tells us that his wife and kids even knew that he did it. And he hid it under his tent. Now, why is this word anathema, or under the ban, so important here? It's important because Jericho was the first, as I've already mentioned to you, Jericho was the first of ten fortified cities. And when they went toward Jericho, the Spirit of the Lord spoke to their leadership and told them, this first of ten fortified cities is my first fruits. It's my tithe. It is mine, and you are not allowed to take one penny of anything of value in that city. It is to be a burnt offering, separated, and it's under a ban, which means you are forbidden to touch anything that is there. If you read the law very carefully, you will see that when they conquered cities, they were normally able to take people as slaves. They were able to take things that belonged to them. They were going to go into Canaan, and they were going to take vineyards that they hadn't planted. They were going to be taking uh, all kinds of gardens and places where vegetables grew that they had never, ever sowed. And they were going to be able to reap all the benefits of Canaan once they conquered it. But this city 
was a first fruits offering to God by fire. And when this guy took stuff out of a Jericho home, he was taking what belonged to God. And when they failed at Ai, Joshua fell on his face in his tent and cried out to God. He was their pastor. He says, God, we've experienced defeat today. And when the rest of the enemies find out that we have lost this battle against a small foe, they're all going to come at us with everything they've got. The pastor actually said to God, it might have been better if we would have never tried to conquer Canaan. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to the man of God and said, get on your feet. I'm going to tell you exactly right now why you lost this battle. There is something under the ban that is hidden among you. And listen to what God said. If you don't believe me, read it yourself. God said, I will not be with you anymore until you remove that thing that's been taken from me. And Joshua, of course, he's pastoring a megachurch. He's got over a million people in his congregation. He hasn't got the foggiest idea who is the guilty party. And God says, don't worry. Tomorrow, I'm going to show you who it is. And the Spirit of God, the light from heaven, just burned with laser focus on that man and identified him and brought him forth and exposed him. And when he was taken out of the way, they never lost another battle in Canaan. Bad posture number two is the posture of covetousness. Going in to serve God not because you love him, but to try to figure out what you can get out of serving him. I'm a missionary, and I have to live this way every day. I can never set my affection or my attention on anything that I'm going to receive from my ministry. I must focus always my attention on love for the people that I'm ministering to. And I must never, ever preach for an offering. I must never ever allow that motive of covetousness to get into me to where I begin choosing where I'm going to preach and teach based on how much I think I might receive in return. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but the ministry is getting too full of this kind of spirit. And I rebuke it in my personal life every single day. And I'll rebuke it every day until I get to heaven because you and I both know how easy it is to look at money in our hand and begin to set our affection too much on that money instead of on the God that saved and called us to serve him, not for money, but because we love him and because we love souls. Number three. Number three, we find in Numbers chapter 12. Let's go there. Numbers chapter 12. As we look at number three, we have a little drama we're going to share with you. So bear with us while we prepare for the drama. Numbers chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And the Lord heard it. Now, this is a hard situation. This is a hard situation. Because Moses, Aaron, and Miriam are all siblings. They're all siblings. But how many of you know who has the primary place of authority of the three? 
Who? Come on, you know this. Moses. And guess what? He's the youngest of the three. Now, how many of you have siblings? How many of you like the idea of your younger brother or sister bossing you around? Isn't that a wonderful feeling? <laughs> Don't you love it when your little brother, your little sister pulls rank on you and tells you, thus saith God, you shall do this and you have to do it? Remember Joseph's brothers? Remember how happy they were when Joseph had that vision about them all one day bowing down in front of him and Oh, Joseph, thank God for you. What a great vision. Is that what they said? No, they said, we're going to kill him. Let's kill this dreamer and see what happens to his dream. Crush him like a bug. How about David? How did his older brothers respond when he went out there to fight Goliath and they didn't? Did they encourage him? Did they encourage him? No. No. In fact, his own older brother, his own older brother tried to intimidate him and criticize him on his way into fight Goliath when he should have been lifting up his brother's hands and encouraging him. So in the Bible, we see that dynamic. It is difficult when the younger has the anointing to lead and you don't. So you know what? They're looking for a reason to murmur and complain about their little brother. And they found a good one. Anybody know what a Cushite is? Hello? Anybody know what a Cushite is? Cush, which is where the Cushites come from. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure that one out. Cush is what we now know as Ethiopia. So guess what color Moses' wife was? Black. Has that ever caused a problem in church? White guy walks in with a black wife? Come on, say amen. You know it's true. When I pastored in Chicago, I had four interethnic marriages. And we welcomed them. And one Sunday, I got kind of bold in front of the microphone, you know. And I said to the congregation, I know some of you probably look sometimes a little bit funny when you see the, these interethnic marriages that are among us. And I could see my interethnic marriages out there getting nervous, you know. Where's our pastor going with this? And I said to him, I just want to say something to you. If you're uncomfortable with this interethnic marriage, you are going to be really uncomfortable in heaven. Because in heaven, our Lord Jesus is going to take a bride from every tribe, kindred, tongue, and nation. If you want to see an interethnic marriage, you just make it up to the, to the marriage of the Lamb, and you're going to see an interethnic marriage that's going to blow you away. <laughs> and if there was any murmuring about our interethnic marriages up to that day, the murmuring stopped right then and there. Now, I don't doubt that this Cushite woman was a believer in Jehovah. I don't believe that Moses would have married an unbeliever. She was most likely a convert to Jehovah God. But she was still black. She was still a different color. And they used that as an occasion to murmur against their leader, their pastor. And you know the story. What happened to the murmurer? She was struck with leprosy. Now we introduce our drama to you. Come on. I found an actress that was willing to be the star of my drama. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay, I'd like you to meet a woman named Sister Badmouth. <laughs> this is not really Sister Badmouth. This is just her name in the drama, okay? <laughs> I ran out of water, so pretend this goes all the way to the top. You see, one Sunday, come over here by the camera so Video Land can see you. 
One day, Sister Badmouth came up to her pastor after the service and said, this is my last Sunday here. I'm not coming back to this church ever again. And the pastor was shocked. He says, why, Sister Badmouth? She says, because there's a young man in this church that's looking at his cell phone during the preaching. There's one of our deacons in the church. I saw him at a restaurant down there in Washington drinking a glass of wine, God forbid. (laughs) And I just saw one of the other young people in the church came into the church and showing off a brand new tattoo on their arm. These are not the kind of people that I think I should be worshiping with and I am leaving. Ah. (laughs) So the pastor said to Sister Badmouth, I want you to come one more Sunday. Could you come just one more Sunday? Sure. Thank you. (laughs) You know you have no choice. (laughs) So the next Sunday, Sister Badmouth showed up, and before the service started, the pastor called her up and said, this is what I want you to do today. Here is a glass full to the brim of water. Hold it. Both hands. Do not let one drop spill. Now, while we're singing this morning, I want you to take that glass of water, and I want you to walk around the congregation. Walk carefully. Don't spill one drop. Go. Go. <laughs> Let's sing. Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together with cords that cannot be broke. You didn't know I could lead worship, did you? Bind us together, Lord. Bind us together, Lord. And let us applaud Sister Badmouth. <laughs> come on, you're almost there. Come on, you almost made it. You almost made it. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Did you spill any water out of there? Not a drop. Why? Why did you not spill one drop? Because it told me not to. <laughs> But how did you avoid spilling a drop? Um, Walking carefully. Walking carefully. And were you staring at the cup the whole time? Yes. Okay. Now, this is what I want you to do, Sister Badmouth. Next Sunday when you come to church, I want you to look at Jesus the same way you stared at this cup. You see, while you were staring at the cup, you weren't able to see... The kid with the tattoo, were you? Mm-mm. No? Mm-mm. You weren't even able to see the deacon that had a glass of white Zinfandel at the uh, no. restaurant either. You weren't able to see the, the kid that likes to look at Facebook during the sermon. You didn't see him either, did you? You didn't see any of these people that give you a hard time with your attitude, did you? No. So I'll tell you what, from now on, when you come to church, I want you to look to Jesus just like you stared at that cup. You may be seated. And I want you to know that I chose her because she's not Sister Badmouth. She never murmurs. She's actually a glorified saint who's already gone to heaven, got a glorified body, and came back to be with us. She never has a problem in her life. That's why I chose her. All right. Did anybody get anything out of that? I hope so. And so does Pastor Dan. (laughs) All right, number four. Bad posture number four. Now, the drama's not over because I'm going to need four men in about five minutes. So I, I need four men right now that are already thinking about participating in another drama because I got another one to close the message. But number four is the posture of pride. We know about this guy. Remember Luke chapter 14, verses 8 to 10, the two people that went to the temple to pray. Remember those two guys? Remember the first guy? Oh, Lord, as I come to you to pray today, I am so thankful for the holy, pure person that I am. (laughs) I give to the poor. I obey all the commandments. 
I tithe very faithfully. I fast twice a week. Did you ever notice in the law of Moses, he never commanded anybody to fast twice a week? That guy had taken on a holy, legalistic conviction that isn't even in the Bible. That's what legalistic people do. That's what proud, religious, stiff-necked people do. So this is the bad posture, the stiff neck of pride. Thank you, Lord, I'm not like this scumbag over here. In fact, I see several scumbags in my church. They are far less holy than I am. I, I'm amazed that I could even tolerate worshiping the Lord with such people sitting near me. Am I not a great prize for the kingdom of God? Heaven must be ecstatic to have me on their side. Aren't I good? Right next to him, he could not even lift his head. He couldn't even lift his head to pray. With his head bowed down, Lord, have mercy on me. The Bible says, have mercy on me, a sinner. But I studied that in the Greek. It says, Lord, have mercy on me, the sinner. He was saying, if there is a sinner in this world, it is definitely me. Zion Christian Church, did it ever occur to you that the church is the only organization in the world where the only basic requirement to join is the recognition that you don't deserve to join? There is no other organization on the earth like ours. People gain a certain level of finance or class or status or education, and they're admitted into clubs and organizations. From A to Z, we have them here in Pittsburgh. But the church is the one organization where the only real requirement placed upon you and me in order to become a part of this family is the admission. We don't deserve. We don't deserve to be here but we don't get what we deserve. I was a pastor years ago in Chicago, and I was in a congregational meeting once, and there was a guy in my church who said something, and this guy scared me to death. He got up in the church and he said, I want what I deserve. I said, my God, brother, don't say that. What do you mean? Because the only thing you and I deserve is hell. Grace is what we get that we don't deserve. Mercy is what we don't get that we do deserve. And you combine grace and mercy together, and you got people that are totally, simply, radically changed. That's us. That's us. Three big surprises you're going to see in heaven. Heard an old preacher say this once. It didn't come from me, but it makes sense. Three big surprises you're going to see in heaven. Number one, you're going to see a whole lot of people there that you never thought you'd see. <laughs> In fact, let me say something to you that might kind of wrinkle your newspaper. When you get to heaven, you're going to surprise some people yourself. <laughs> They're going to look at you and say, man, how did you get in here? The grace and mercy of God is greater than I ever dreamed it was. Look at you. You're here. <laughs> Surprise number two, we're not going to see a lot of people that we thought we would see. And surprise number three, you're going to be there. Amen. So look at your neighbor and say, my friend, my friend, if you get to heaven, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> and that's what Zion is. We're a house full of miracles. Say hallelujah to the Lord your God.
that's who we are. We're a household full of miracles, walking, breathing, renewed, saved miracles of what we are. So look out for that stiff neck when you're praying, brother. Conclude with this one. And this is very simple, and I'll just mention it briefly because I don't need to say much about it. And that's the posture of unbelief. Looking at the giants and thinking that you're a grasshopper. These people had grasshoppers on the brain. That's how they saw themselves. We're just a bunch of grasshoppers compared to those big giant warriors we saw in Canaan. I don't know about you, but there's no grasshopper in me. Look at your neighbor. Tell him, there's no grasshopper in me. Is there one in you? Let me cast it out. How about we cast out a couple of grasshoppers today? Because we can take the land. We can take the promises of God. We can overcome sin. We can be delivered from vices and addictions. We can mature. We can grow. And we can shake the city of Pittsburgh for Jesus Christ. We can do it. We are not grasshoppers. So here they are, the five postures to avoid. Come on. Casual, covetous, murmuring, proud, and unbelieving. Now we're going to conclude with the winning posture. And for that, we're going to look at Exodus chapter 17. And now I need those four guys. Come on, four minutes. Before I choose you, you can come up. It's kind of like being, you know, the army. You can either enlist or we can just grab you. <laughs> come on, there's one right here. Hey, there we go. He's, gonna, he's the first one. I'm going to make him Moses, okay? You're Moses now. Okay. Come on, yeah, come on. Come on, come on. All right. Come on, you get to be, you get, you get to be a Joshua. You get to be Aaron. And I need a he called her, which is kind of confusing, right? Where's her? Come here. You're, not, you're him, but right now you're her, okay? Just come over here. Okay. Now, you all know the story, okay? Right after they crossed the Red Sea. Victory! Exodus 15 was a victory song. The Lord is mighty, and they're beating tambourines and shouting glory, hallelujah. And the next thing they know, Amalek is after them. They had just gotten the victory over the Egyptians. And the, they, before they could even sit down and have a cup of coffee and rejoice over the thing, here comes Amalek behind them trying to take them out. So what did Moses do? He said to his worker, his leader, Joshua, get out there and fight. Come over here. Which one? Raise, raise your shoulder. They're over there. Not them. Those are your brothers. They're not going to fight oh, them. Okay. The enemy's over there, okay? Oh, okay. Yeah, don't, don't get confused. This is not the enemy. This is your brothers. Look over there. There's the enemy. Now raise your hand. That's your sword. You got a sword in that hand. Hold the sword high because you're leading the workers of the Lord into victory. All right. Now, your job as the pastor, your Moses, the pastor, your job is intercede for this guy. So what do you have? You have your two hands in the air. All right? Because these are hands raised in intercessory prayer for your workers. Now, imagine three or four hours have gone by. Your arm is getting tired. And his arms are beginning to do this. So here comes Aaron. Get over here. You're on the left side. You know left and right, right? Okay, left side. Right side, there's her, who's really a him. Okay. Lift. Grab that arm. Grab that arm. Don't let go. Keep it right up there. This, my friends, is the winning posture. He is aiming for victory. His pastor has got his back in prayer. And the rest of the workers are supporting their pastor 
until Amalek and every other one of our enemies has been destroyed. This, Zion, is the winning posture for 2020. Amen, Brother Dan. This is Pastor Dan Kramer from Zion Christian Church. I want to thank you for watching this video of our worship service. God is on the move and we are so thankful. I'd love to invite you to join us Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock here at Zion Christian Church. I know that you would be encouraged by our worship and the ministry of God's Word. It's a wonderful group of people to be connected to. Why not join us this Sunday at Zion Christian Church? God bless you. Oh,